and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We're in the midst of Vermont's Fair and Field Day season. The State Fair in Rutland runs through tomorrow, and the Orleans County Fair goes through Sunday. On August 23rd, the Caledonia County Fair begins its five-day run, and one week from today, on Friday, August 25th, the state's largest fair, the Champlain Valley Fair, opens its gates. Joining me this afternoon is the Champlain Valley Fair's Director of Operations, Chris, Chris Ashby. Chris, thanks so much for coming in. Good morning. What is your favorite thing about the fair? Um, you know, as a staff person, probably my favorite thing is the people. You mm -hmm. know, we work all year round on it. We spend, you know, as soon as the fair ends, literally, we start planning the next year's fair. So for us to see, you know, people sitting in the bleachers enjoying one of the free shows, like the dog show or something like that, or wandering through the animals, really is very, very gratifying to see people enjoying that piece of it, knowing that you put all that hard work in so that they will come have fun and make that connection. Um, and of course, you know, there's the standard fair things. <laughs> I, I could eat fair food pretty much every day of the year, so. Now tell me a little bit about the variety of different concerts and shows that are happening this year. Oh, we have all kinds of different stuff. So we opened with Mr. Mellencamp, John Mellencamp, for those of you, you know, familiar with his music. Some mm -hmm. of you might know him as John Cougar Mellencamp from back in his early days. And then we also have done a few things to help bring and make it you know, easy for families to come. So on the Tuesday night of the fair, we have a free show. So if you just come into the, the grounds, you get to go into the grandstand and see a show called Satisfaction. It's the nation's leading Rolling Stones tribute band. And then on Monday night for Kids Day, we have a circus with the, put on by the, it's the Wonderly Circus Extravaganza, and the Wonderlies are the uh, artistic directors for Circus Smirkus. So oh, it's, again, really? a great, another great opportunity for families to come see a show. There's no added charge to see it. You just, it comes with your gate admission. And so in addition to the free shows, the fair also has some special discount days as well. We do. Um, there's everything from Carload Special Day, which is a great opportunity for a whole family to come in, to deals like six after six on weekdays where you can come in at a discount. There's Kids Day where there's a child reduced admission. There's Food Bank Day, which has been a great day for us where if you donate two non-perishable items, you get free admission as long as you do that before two in the afternoon. And if you bring two more non-perishables, you get a discount on a ride bracelet. Last year, we were the single largest food drive in a single day they've ever done and raised just over 7,000 pounds of food. That's fantastic. So, Yeah, and that's part of what we're here to do is give back to the community that way. So we kind of like to leverage those opportunities to help people get in to help other causes. Of course, the fair has its roots in agriculture. Tell me a little bit about how that is still very much a big part of the fair. It's very much still there. Um, it's, you know, people kind of know us because the concerts really, they steal the light and, you know, you've got the midway sparkling and noisy down on the other end. But at any given time, there's probably a thousand different animals on the grounds. Everything from the horse shows out back to the cattle, all kinds of different cattle. There's two different cattle shows that change over during the week. There's oxen, there's rabbits, there's a, a small area called Old McDonald's Farm where you can see baby pigs and miniature horses and things like that. So anytime you're at the fair, there are just hundreds of animals, if not thousands, around the grounds. And competitions as well going on with the animals. Absolutely. So, you know, you have a cattle competition, a cattle show, you have a garden competition for the giant pumpkins, you have um, a sheep competition for different both breeds of wool and or meat sheep. So there's there's traditional agriculture where, you know, the animals are actually judged and kids come in to do it. There's a poultry barn where we have a great group of 4-H kids who compete in poultry. So there, pretty much any traditional agricultural animal you, there is a competition for. Let's talk a little bit about 4-H because that has been a, a big component. I mean, these kids um, spend the entire season getting their animals ready for the show ring, and it's a really important learning curve for them. Absolutely. You know, not only do they learn about the animals, they learn presentation skills, they learn uh, public speaking skills, and each one has their specialty. So there's, you know, there's different standards for, for the 4-H kids who are competing in poultry. There's different standards for the cattle kids. And and they, they start really, really young. I mean, we have, there's a junior division in 4-H. So it's 4-H, while everybody sort of knows it as agriculture, it really is a great opportunity for kids to really become very well-rounded civic citizens. And that's part of their curriculum in addition. I mean, there's, and there's a horse show on the later in the week for 4-H kids. So really, any variety of agriculture kids are interested in, there's a 4-H opportunity. Let's talk a little bit about the renewed emphasis on horses. You know, horses in this area have, have really become quite popular, not just as, as work animals, although we have categories for competing in, in all of those. There's pulling horses, which are traditional, you know, farm horses. There's draft horses where they, you know, are pulling wagons, which are how things used to be delivered, mm -hmm. down to the VHSA horse show on the last day of the fair, which is a, you know, traditional English style, amongst other topics, riding show that starts at 8 in the morning and it'll run till 7 or 8 o'clock at night. We added barrel racing about three years ago on Thursday nights, which is incredibly exciting to watch mm -hmm. if you've never seen it. Those riders just amaze me. So there, there is all kinds of variety of course shows, and that sort of reflects what's happening in the community.
And so there are thousands of animals at the fair as well. And so keeping people safe and healthy is obviously a priority. Talk a little bit about that. If, if you, as you wander through the fairgrounds, you'll see hand washing stations everywhere because, you know, a fair naturally you're going to see lots of animals, but you're also going to be eating, and those don't necessarily mix well in terms of human health. So as you wander around the fairgrounds, there are hand sanitizing stations. Would please use them as you go through out of the animal areas and before you go eat. There's obviously, also we have restrooms and things like that where you can go wash, but you really need to separate food from the animals because of the you know, obvious health risk concerns. Which is also actually another good example of a way to sort of bring people into the loop and, and teach them a little bit about um, animal husbandry and, mm -hmm. and, um, and food safety. Absolutely, and, and animal husbandry in particular, and just sort of make that connection between farms and, and where your food comes from, because that in today's modern age, I mean, Amazon just bought Whole Foods, so you can now probably have food delivered to your house. Mm -hmm. That connection between the farm and your food is, is somewhat obscured. I won't say it's lost, but it has been obscured and hidden a little bit. So it's nice to give kids and families the opportunity to understand a little bit about Vermont's agriculture and some of our history and some of where it is in modern day. Mm -hmm. And a chance for kids to actually even touch some of these animals as Absolutely. well, which is maybe a first time Absolutely. for them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the old McDonald's farm is great for that. And you know, there's nothing quite as cute as a baby pig squealing around, <laughs> running around the pen. So there's opportunities to see all those things or to see, you know, ducks and before I started working at the fair uh, quite a while ago now, I had no idea the, of the variety of poultry that's raised in Vermont. I mean, if you go into the poultry barn, there's you know, 60, 70, 80 different varieties of chickens. <laughs> Who knew? <Yeah. laughs> so. Now tell me a little bit about um, the volunteers and, and the staff that are on hand to help people as well at the fairgrounds. So um, typically during the fair there's about a combination between combination volunteer and staff. There's about 400 people who work at the fair in different shifts. Obviously we're open quite a few hours. You know we really get going quite early in the morning. Six or seven o'clock in the morning things are moving and happening all the way up past after midnight when we have to reset. So there's volunteer opportunities for people who want to help and then we have staff who are there you know in information kiosks obviously doing maintenance and maintaining the grounds. So, you know, just lots and lots of people at the fair. And they're all sort of part of our family, if you will. It's mm -hmm. the fair family that comes together for two weeks a year. And so the Champlain Valley Fair opens next Friday, August 25th, and runs through September 3rd. You can get more information, including a schedule of all the events, by going to champlainvalleyfair.org or by calling the fair office at 878-5545. That's 878-5545. We may not have grown the biggest pumpkin over the summer, but maybe you do have some flowers that you think are worthy of a blue ribbon. You don't need a green thumb to win, but a few tips from the judges may help. Here's longtime flower judge and UVM horticulture specialist, Leonard Perry. One of the first things you want to do is cut early in the morning when the plants are hydrated, they have plenty of water in them. If it hasn't rained, if they are dry, you can't cut in the morning. You want to make sure you water them real well and then leave them a few hours so they can get that water up in the plant so they're nice and turgid. Then you want to cut them at the right stage. If you cut them uh, too far along, they'll be faded when they come in. Um, and one of the things that we judges look for is if a flower is kind of unusual and maybe the only one, we, you know, get cut a little more slack where there's something that's real common like zinnias or sunflowers tend to be a little bit more picky and here's a good example of a sunflower that's not quite as uniform it's still very beautiful it's kind of a different color but you see all the stamens the little flower parts aren't quite open here whereas the one right over next to it here is almost perfectly uniform all the way around that I think would be a blue uh, ribbon winner right there so the stage of cutting making sure they're nice and uniform is one of the key things of course when you cut you want to get them right in water uh, even better is flower preservative. If you can get some at a local florist, they have little packets, very inexpensive. That really will help uh, keep the flowers a lot longer. The other thing to watch for is read the directions. Um, it calls to one stem. These have one stem. This one has two stems. So I didn't read the directions, so unfortunately that one would probably be disqualified because you can't really uh, compare two stems to one stem. So if nothing else to make sure you follow the, the directions. So once you have the cut flowers, you brought them in, they're in good shape. Um, you can also arrange with them. Let's go take a look at some uh, good examples of arrangements. So once you have the flowers, um, you can arrange them. Now you can be real elaborate, it can be very simple. Um, there are many examples of both. It can be very creative, like someone has done here. They've taken, a, in using all kinds of containers, they've taken a, looks like a wire bicycle, covered it with moss, and wrapped it with the sphagnum moss, and used the coneflower heads off of coneflower. So think of all the plant parts you might use here, the bicycle. They've carried that forward through in the arrangement. So nice continuity there. Uh, great colors, the orange, uh, 
cosmos and some marigolds against, and rudbeckia in the middle there, against this uh, nice green moss bed. One of the main things you want to do though is uh, cover the foam. Um, usually you put these in florist foam, which is something you get at a florist. It absorbs lots of water. That's what they use for uh, cut flowers. That's what you use. But make sure that's covered up. That's one of the things we look for as judges, not to see any of the uh, stuff that we shouldn't see, if you will, like the foam. They've done that with the sedum here. Just very nice. Now there are many different types of uh, arrangements you can do in classes. Um, you can find those in the handbook. Uh, miniatures are one of my favorite. They're just so lovely. Some are just so small. And I love this one with the little white Queen, Queen Anne's lace and little blue flowers. It goes with the blue and the white there on the cup. Just a lovely little thing. Um, this is a little bit larger and more open. This lovely little swan. Um, that's a very nice one, I think, with the ageranum in it. Um, this one has um, is lovely in a sense, but it's kind of like a pincushion. It's really short. Uh, it needs to be in proportion, any of these arrangements, to the uh, uh, container. This one's pretty big and the flowers should probably be again you know half or twice as high to have a little bit more proportion but again as with the cut flowers read the directions. Leonard and I have been judging for about 19 years now and some of the things I'm looking for in an arrangement as a judge um, I'll start with this one here in a clear glass container with water. First and foremost I'm looking for quality of the flower. I want to see blemish free, no insect damage, nice uh, uh, cut it just the right time. Secondly, I don't want to see any foliage in the water. It has to be clean. That way the arrangement lasts longer and it looks a lot nicer. This is really a really nice example of what we're looking for. The composition is beautiful. Uh, there's a proportion with the container. You look at how big the container is, how tall the arrangement. Um, some of these are placed deep in for nice depth. It draws your eye in. Nice colors. Uh, this one is actually the category was uh, shades of one color and this is executed beautifully. This up here, um, I think it's a harvest category, and it's absolutely, again, just lovely. The arrangement complements the container perfectly. Um, if you look closely, she, has, uh, she or he has some incredible elements in here uh, with the caps of the acorn, just adds a lot of interest and texture, and the colors are just lovely and really evokes a, a fall arrangement. Th these are two examples of some really nice entries that we've gotten. A lot of times people come in and they wonder why they didn't get a blue. And uh, the comments will, we try to be really constructive. Here's what we were looking for, here's maybe what was missing. Um, that, that the flowers were wilted when we saw them and that's kind of tough. We just can't give a blue to, with wilted flowers. So we're trying to um, educate people so that they know what, what we're looking for and what anybody would be looking for in a, in a good arrangement. And actually over the years I've seen the quality really creep up and I hope that maybe that was, uh, had something to do with our comments, um, but the quality has just been exceptional at the fair. Some of these could be professional arrangements. They're lovely, really, really nice. Now to get the rules and everything else that you need to know about the various contests at the fair, go online to champlainvalleyfair.org or call 878-5545. Chris Ashby is the director of operations at the fair, and of course after flowers and giant pumpkins and animals, there's of course the Midway. The Midway. Um, we changed Midway companies a couple of years ago and really have enjoyed our new partners in it. Great rides, lots of fun, you know, great entertainment. A uh, good com really good company to work with out of Florida that comes to us. They're at another fair right now, set up and running. So mm -hmm. we're excited to have them rolling. They're actually the last Midway company in America to travel by train. Oh, no kidding. And so they, a lot of their rides will arrive via train. And this year, for the first time, they're unloading in Burlington. And last year, they unloaded in St. Albans because that's where the spur was. Mm -hmm. But this year, they'll be actually unloading down right on the waterfront in Burlington and bringing them up to the fair. So. Oh, that's nice. Now, you also have a Military Appreciation Day, which I want to talk we about. We do. We want to honor our, our people who served in the military. And so on Friday, September 1st, anybody who served in the military, past or present, with appropriate ID, gets into the fair for free. And also, let's talk again about um, the food shelf effort that you food guys shelf. run. Yeah, great opportunity to help out other Vermonters. If you come in on uh, when, or Thursday, rather, uh, August 31st, two non-perishable food items before 2 o'clock will get you free admission to the fair. Two more will get you a discount on a ride bracelet. So a great opportunity to come in and enjoy the fair at a significantly reduced price. And also help out your neighbors. Exactly. All right. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, that's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.